Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to episode two of the ET Stands production that is classic Cronulla Chronicles. Uh, this week we're playing the Canterbury Bulldogs in round two of 2024, but we're going to take you back to 2001 uh, to a game that I'm sure all of you uh, remember fondly. We're doing oh, a bit of a rule we, breaker. Williams. We do, but a bit of a rule breaker. I was trying to line up with each match a corresponding match at the same venue, let's say Sharks versus Bulldogs at home, but no, we had to bring out the big gun early. Uh, 2001, week two of the finals. We all know the score. We'll say it right here. Bottom line up front, 52-10 to the good guys in what was the fourth highest score and remains the fourth highest score in uh, New South Wales Rugby League or NRL or ARL Premiership history in a finals match of 52 points. The six, equal six biggest margin in a match and it was just an amazing time. Uh, taking you back to a venue that no longer exists in its present, for, present form. We all love the old uh, Sydney Football Stadium. Um, and what a day. David, I think you were there. You were there I where? was indeed. I think this is maybe my all-time favourite Sharks match, actually. or certainly up there. What a Just what a legendary team it was. Like I just love this team. and I know we'll get into that in a second. I actually... Um, yeah, I remember I went headed out to the SFS, and I, I remember seeing... A, a mate of mine from school who was a little heartbroken afterwards, but he kind of understood why the Bulldogs lost. So it was a red hot Bulldogs team at the time. So, of course, 2001 is the year that I say the Sharks should have won. We were red hot. So, yeah, I was I was there the week before at the uh, the quarterfinal against the the Broncos, where Paul Miller had a blinder with a hat trick um, and carved up Wendell Saylor. Uh, and then I was there the following week in the pre prelim heartbreak. Uh, had great tickets on the 40 meter line and it was all looking good up until what about midway through the second half. Uh, I haven't watched that match again either, but this one, you're right, it's up there. Obviously, there's some big matches in 2016 and some other matches that stand out, but this is. This, this one is probably was an absolute ripper. The, or actually, I'd say, is the most comprehensive finals performance by a Sharks team ever. Uh, yes, the Bulldogs had their own injury troubles and a disrupted uh, lead into the match, but they were, we'll talk about their form in a second, but they were going through a real period of uh, dominance. If you look at salary cap notwithstanding 2002 issues, uh, but then their form in 2003 and then eventual premiers in 2004, uh, they were one of the teams to beat and didn't we beat them where, and well that day. So looking at the form heading into it, uh, Sharks had beaten the uh, the Broncos 22-6 in, in the first match of the finals at Shark Park and what was a bit of a, a rainy evening. Uh, at the same time, the Bulldogs had given up a handy lead against the Dragons and lost by one. So in the commentary, they were talking about how the Bulldogs were expecting to be having the week off, uh, lick their wounds, let their injured players come back, it shows the the how important having that week off is. Uh, they didn't get it, and then they came up against a red hot Cronulla Sharks side. Though, without you, call, you call out the importance of the week off. Phil Gould mentions it in commentary that coming into that year, um, the teams that had the week off in the, the top eights basically were never winning. So it was other yeah. teams that were going through. So we obviously You're know right. the 1999 Sharks had the week off and didn't go through, and Parramatta countless yeah. times are minor premiers and. I think from 98 or they were second uh, and didn't go through so it had happened a little bit but yeah certainly the bulldogs needed that week off and they the obviously beat the sharks a couple of weeks earlier also yes so fresh off the back of a it was the sharks final home match of the year uh where we beat the, the broncos 24 16 had a handy early lead on that one and the broncos came back and were looking good a chris walker runaway try put them in front uh and it wasn't looking good uh, and then a late try to Chris McKenna. Was that the the Statue of Liberty game as well, I think, maybe? Uh, maybe not. I don't, I don't, I don't, know. I don't know. The Statue of Liberty no, was late. Oh. McKenna did score a try in the corner where he'd done a, a bit. It wasn't quite a Liberty play, but he had offloaded. Uh, they'd come back to the left and then come back to the right. And then I think it was a, I don't know, over over the head pass and he caught it and scored. And then Preston Campbell kicked it from the sideline to, to put us... Ahead, I think it was twenty. We were still erratic, though. Look at that, thirty blot against the Warriors. I'm glad we didn't. Well, that was that, that was at the end of a long winning streak. I didn't see how many matches it was. I can bring those that data up shortly. But uh, that was the Sharks had had a checkered uh, season with injuries being affecting or affecting their mm. form, including Peachy being out uh, earlier that year. 
uh, and then they they went on a winning run once they got Peachy back. They moved Campbell to the halves famously. We'll talk about that in a second, uh, and then moved McKenna to the centres full time and had Millor there too. Uh, and then over in Auckland didn't go so well against the Warriors, who were fighting some form and snuck into the eight uh, in eighth position that year for their first finals appearance, and then got hammered by Parramatta. But uh, there was so no shame going to Auckland. Year. So, like we said last mm. week, with the Warriors building up from 1999, yeah. they, were, they were starting to come good. That's not an anomaly. And then the Bulldogs were one of the form teams. They finished second. And then the week after the emotion-charged final home match for Matt Rogers, John Lang, Martin Lang, Adam Dyke, so many players leaving the club. I remember being there and everyone was doing lap of honours and, uh, and then followed up the following week against the Bulldogs at the showground and went to an early 12-0 lead. Uh, the Dogs worked their way back in 14 all. I'm not sure if you remember it, but a very controversial moment happened with referee Paul Simpkins where uh, Jason Stevens had lifted the knee with, in possession with the ball and they oh, went back two tackles. At, at the, right. the play continued two tackles. He got a tip off from the video ref, uh, marched it back downfield. Penalty. penalty, and I think it was about 30 out right in front and Hazamil Masri kicked it and uh, right. and gave the Dogs the win. So the Sharks, yes, they... they Look good early. I think we we didn't capitalise on that. We could have actually won that match by a bit more, but the Bulldogs showed their class, worked their way back into it and won. Uh, we had a handy win over the Tigers during a period where we it was only a second season. I think that was our first ever win over the West Tigers after we drew with them early in that year. Uh, 16 all in a match at Shark Park where the Tigers scored four tries and didn't kick any goals and the Sharks were woefully out of form and with injuries to Peachy and the like. So uh, it was an up and down year. The Dogs uh, were looking pretty good apart from the only loss in that uh, outside the Dragons semi-final loss, which was a shock, uh, was a loss to the minor premiers Parramatta who were red hot. Uh, we all know how that grand final went uh, for them. So um, it was an interesting one. Sorry? Sharks would have beaten the Eels in I know, and that's that's the difficult, that's the tough part because we'd beaten the Eels way back in round two after we'd been yep. smashed at home by the Dragons in round one. Um, Adam Dykes with a shaky field goal from about 35 out to, to give us a, a right. last minute. That's right, 13-12 or something, wasn't it? At 13-12, there was only one try scored by each team. Uh, penalty goals yep. reign supreme, uh, but the Sharks, obviously, yeah, opportunity lost there. We'll, we'll talk about the prelim final another day, but... This one, coming into it, uh, the Dogs had their injury troubles. Sharks were favourite, but only just. Uh, and what followed was something that was, was quite uh, quite amazing, really. Quite amazing. Um, so, hold on, uh, so, you're going to go through the, uh, yeah, the teams? Yeah, I'll, I'll the go with the good guys first. So here are the Cronulla Sharks. Number one, David Peachy. Uh, the back line of Rogers, Mellor, McKenna and Best, the halves, Adam Dykes and Preston Campbell. The back row of Nathan Long, Paul McKick, Nicholas and Nick Graham. Front row of Jason Stevens and Martin Lang with Jason Ferris in the hooking position between those two big boppers. On the bench, Chris Beatty, Andrew Pearce, Luke Stewart, Dean Treister, the coach, John Lang. Uh, the Canterbury Bankstown Bulldogs were known as only the Bulldogs during that era. I think it was actually just the Sharks and the Bulldogs due to them both uh, lopping their place names off. But uh, Luke Patton was the fullback. Hazem El Masri, Nigel Varganart, Willie Talao, Shane Martini, the back line. Darren Smith in Jersey 13 moving in for the repl uh, to replace the injured Braith and Asta with Daryl Trindle in at seven for both Polamounta and Sherwin being injured. The front row of Darren Britt, Adam Perry in Jersey 19 and Willie, uh, sorry, Steve Pross. A young Willie Mason in Jersey 18. Jamie Feeney and Steve Ridden finished out the, uh, the, the back row there. And everyone's favourite former Shark, Corey Hughes in Jersey 9, Paul Rahihi, Dennis Scott, and future Shark, Adam Peake, rounding out the bench. The coach was the late Steve Folks. That even worked perfectly yeah. with the music cutting it off in time, didn't it? Yeah. Um, Timed it like I'd practised. So there's a lot of stuff happening with this Bulldogs team at the time. So Sharks are pretty much full strength from memory, whereas uh, with a couple of niggles, whereas the Bulldogs were missing. So Paul Amounter was actually playing hooker for the Bulldogs that season. They had had Rod Silver play wing a few weeks earlier. Uh, Braith and Astor was, was 5'8 for that team. They typically did play Trindle as the halfback that season. It wasn't until next season where Brent Sherwin came into the team. And then Brent Sherwin was also frequently on the bench. So yeah. They're missing a whole bunch of characters um, who just weren't floating around. And then and also right. Darren Britt was under a massive injury cloud. Um, yeah. Coming into the match also. And he'd missed the week before. So they were well busted up. Uh, coming into this match, yeah. So you're right. It was it, it was 
if you're going to time your run in getting the Bulldogs, that was it. But at the same time, they had plenty of depth. And as the uh, the events of the following season showed, that they, they were doing a Melbourne Storm, so to speak, um, before the Melbourne Storm even did that. So uh, not that we cast aspersions there with our own salary cap issues. But, yeah, they they had lots of depth. It was still a very solid side that they had still... Um, as you can see, they, they they had some handy moments. Early on, they had a try disallowed. I suppose we'll roll forward to the actual match and go through the try scores. Yeah, the well, it's going to make a commentary on the Sharks teams for you, Matty. Well, well it what was a great un- looking Sharks team. Unchanged, How good? unchanged. The only things I will say, so Paul McNicholas was in after, I think, Sean Ryan had received a, a season-ending injury and then departed yep. to Hull. Uh, Russell Richardson was actually out of favour and playing in reserve grade after Chris McKenna had moved there after he'd had some injury yep. troubles, which his whole career he played was fifteen or twenty games something that season, didn't he? Russell he Richardson? did play a fair amount, but he wasn't. He was actually fit and not chosen. Uh, Chris Beatty, he'd been in the club. This is his second season for us, and was just so good coming off the bench. Martin Lang was back from. Uh, I think he'd had a bit of an injury issue the the couple of weeks before that, and Stevens was in peak form, uh, and you'll see soon how how good. And- um, great kicking game, great running game, just the the quintessential late 90s lock, which is interesting given that Tawera Nikau was our lock in the preceding years before 98, uh, and he was so good. Uh, Nick, if he hung around, maybe we would have lost Nick Graham because I think he's, he's an out-and-out out out lock for that era. Uh, interesting enough, too, having Jason Ferris as starting nine versus Dean Treister. That was uh, a bit of a trend in the back end of that year. Uh, but also... Played equal minutes, though, didn't they, those two? So they did. They they did. I don't know how many interchanges there was during that area. I think they started to bring in an interchange law or rule versus the unlimited that they'd had back in the the late nineties. But yeah, uh, there was still a bit of uh, swapping and changing. You'll hear, yeah, you'll hear a bit about Luke Stewart later on in the coverage. Uh, but I will touch on so the great Preston Campbell Dalian and medal winner. It was in the Bulldogs uh, match earlier that year. So back in round ten, the Bulldogs have beaten the Sharks on a Friday night at home, twenty points to six. Uh, some people will remember that's the match where, unfortunately, so Steve's wife and Matt's mum, uh, Carol Rogers, had passed away from a, a battle of cancer, uh, battle with cancer, sorry, and they had the minute silence and there may have been a bit of controversy there. And the Bulldogs came out and carved up. But Campbell was starting fullback uh, and John Lang mid that match had transitioned into halfback. And the Sharks, I can't remember the stats, but I do remember watching it and, there, and they do refer to it in the coverage of this match. They say that... Uh, they got an awful lot of line breaks and Campbell was just electric. Uh, and then from that moment onwards, so the following week, they played against the Tigers. Campbell played starting half back, and then they didn't look back from there. So uh, it was, I suppose, quite a momentous occasion the first time around against the Bulldogs. And then, yeah, here we are and we reap the rewards. Given that here, yeah, the Preston mini Campbell. peach. How good was the mini peach? The mini peach, apricot, plum, whatever you want to call him. He was so good. And having Campbell and Dykes just freewheeling, free oh, running. Oh, so good. Uh, and just on that, I suppose, probably one of the – talking about his Dallium year. So earlier that year was Matt Rogers' first match back from – it appeared that he was off for the entire season with a shoulder injury. Uh, we played the Newcastle Knights at home. And the final score of that one was 49 points to 30. We know that the Knights go on, beat us the following week and win the Premiership. But that is the by far the most points conceded by a Premiership winning team. Uh, and we could well have broken that record, that, I suppose. Oh, so teams, to speak. That, teams that concede 50 points never win Premierships. Well, yeah, Chris Beattie scored late in that match and it was disallowed, I believe, for a forward pass. But that would have made it, what, 53 or 55, 30 yeah. in, a, in a very high-scoring match. So the Knights, yes, their defence wasn't on point that day, but they still scored 30 no, we points. Pumped them. I remember sitting we, on the hill for that. We did pump one. them. David Peachy scored a true hat-trick in the second half, including a great intercept from Robbie O'Davis. Uh, Davis bizarrely picking the ball up on his trial line, back turn, throwing a a massive pass across his trial that line that Peachy just absolutely hilarious. Just that took try. with two hands and that's where he almost ran into Botany Bay. I think that was his first time almost running into Botany Bay and then just became his thing ever since. But uh it yeah, was, and including we're the gonna talk about this match for like an hour. This, this we are, is, we yeah. are. So right, let's we'll get on to the uh there's plenty of big the moments. Slide. So how did it and play out Teddy? Well, I'll start. So you were there. There was, I think, a minute silence for September 11. So that was, was. that was very much in the. Um, I'll just touch on that for one second because that's one of the or one reason, I suppose, that we weren't there ourselves. We, I had my soccer end of season uh, presentation day that day, and I remember it was a real change. All the parents, well, I was 12 at the time, talking. Obviously, it had been a, a hugely um, 
history changing moment. Uh, horrible, and you can never underplay that. But uh, I do know that there was a fair bit of the build up too, talking about, oh, is there any concerns of that for big events like this? I think the crowd was only 21,000. I'm not sure if that affected it. It was a hot sunny Sunday afternoon, 2 p.m. game, Channel Terrific. 9 coverage at 4 p.m. Awesome day. I came home, and that was in the days. That's right. It was 2 p.m. kickoff, and then they showed the match at 4 p.m. Did they do Correct. That case? So I got home at 3 o'clock, and I chuck, jumped on the, the dial up internet, and I think put the radio on too to see which one I could hear first. Uh, and then the, the radio came through and said a halftime score, 20 points to six, or 24 points to four, sorry, 24 points to four. I was like, wow, that's, well, that's terrific. Surely Cronulla, surely Cronulla can't lose from here. Surely and then I just, we can't lose from here. Which we've said so many times before. And, and yes, we know how they all end. But, and you'll hear in the coverage that the, the commentators, it was only three years on from the, the famous Paul Carriage inspired Parramatta Eels 18 2 capitulation to the Bulldogs. So, with a Bulldogs team that was full of the stars, albeit without Rod Silver and Craig Paul Amounter, but uh, that could come They're back still from talking anywhere. Up that the Bulldogs could come back. They were talking back talking at scores. The score was 30 to 10, and I think even 36 10. Uh, and they were talking about it. They were talking about it at a great moment in the first half when Nick Graham kicked a cracking 40-20. Andrew Voss oh, was mid-talking. Yeah. Andrew Voss was mid-sideline expert commentary coming through going, well, the Bulldogs will come back as they're like, hang on a sec, this is a 40-20. And the Sharks are on the attack. Oh, and they've scored again. So, but early on, uh, there was a, a great early try to that man, Nick Graham, which uh, at the you can hear the commentary in our or the sting in the commentary in our, our lead up, our countdown video before our regular season show. And it is so good. Uh, Dykes to Campbell to Peachy. He's away uh, over the 30 meter line now. Colin Best, get, can he get there? Gets it away. Graham, they're over. It was so good. Six minutes. And you that can see the passion of everyone. Yeah. Nick Graham was just, I, I think um, Shane Martini ended up on his head, had kind of did a, a forward roll over the top of Nick Graham and knocked him back over as he scored. And he was still getting up, just like giving it to some Bulldogs. Uh, fans right in front of him um, and then Rogers nailed it left foot conversion from the from the sideline uh, and interesting that was enough, basically the same corner of the um, as the, the ground was the James Maloney try James Maloney intercept you're right that was the exact same it corner. had a similar uh, feeling to it um, it I did the, the finals matches later haven't not until 2016 did we quite have the same feeling as that one I think um, You're right. Those mid nineties, because the year before, sorry, several years before that, nineteen ninety six when we beat the Broncos, that was obviously big, and there was the Peachy try also scoring. Uh, that was the same. That Broncos corners. one, that was oh, that, and that was also scrum. in that corner. That corner. So that it's there the greatest, the, Yeah, we should. Now that, that we think of it, that move. Yeah, that was the that that scrum move to yeah yeah the wraparound play. He's away. Right, so what were the yes. other highlight tries in this? So one? Obviously you've got the going through it. I'll just I'll just touch on Matt Rogers for a second because because I heard it on SEN the other night. So I'll give a plug to Matt uh, Sats and the Rat on on uh, weeknights on SEN. Matt Rogers was talking about uh, how he's the first player in rugby league, or Australian rugby league history anyway, to use a kicking tee. Everyone used sand up until the late nineties and in ninety seven when he was kicking the Gilbert Super League ball, and obviously he had experience in rugby union with that as well. Um, he was talking about how. He's kicking improved exponentially, and he was kicking at 80% or 80-plus percent during Super League. That went away with the Steeden ball. Uh, but, yeah, he was kicking it well that day. He kicked seven from nine, as we saw. Uh, only two minutes after the try that was scored, the Bulldogs had a disallowed try. Darren Smith with a forward pass to Steve Reardon through a, a pretty big gap. One of our players had shot out of the line. Yeah, and Gould was, Gould was all, oh, was maybe that wasn't forward. And then when Bloody clearly... Clearly it was a me- Bulldogs at this point. Oh, not like the com- You're right. The commentary. I was already sold on the fact that everyone against Cronulla uh, was against Cronulla at the age yeah. of twelve. Then, but this listening back to this just was was diabolical and hilarious and 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 pretty satisfying given that we finally won in 2016. But listening to them crying over a pass that was clearly a meter forward uh, and. Bill Harrigan was right in line with it, and they were saying he was in a terrible position for it and moaning and all the Bill rest. Harrigan of it. was clearly a better referee. Oh, and, Harrigan is, is, I think, still far and away the best referee I've ever seen. Adam G's gone. I think the Sharks to might beat the Knights if it wasn't for Simpkins the next week, actually. You're right. We you did didn't have Harrigan perform, the next week. We did seem to perform well under Harrigan, um, uh, even though he, he had just, his own controversies. Yeah, but, but he, he let the game flow. Under that bloody rubbish of the, um, of the unconscious bias that comes against the Sharks. We still, it was present then, it's present now. Sharks. You're right. 
You're right. I think that was a good thing about Harrigan throughout his entire career that he never really had that aura around him where he was never really a hometown referee. Um, I know that he blew the pee out of the whistles both ways at Shark Park and other places too where you'd see, yeah, other ones, uh, insert name here, that would definitely get the aura of the Manly or the Broncos or yeah, the old penalty Broncos uh, joke. But anyway, the um, we took the two shortly afterwards. Uh, Which was the correct decision. Correct decision after Preston Campbell with a tidy little chip and chase got taken out, uh, blatantly taken out by... So I think that it was, was 14 nil or for 8 nil. For 8 nil, but then really short. So back, straight from that kickoff, we got another penalty. And interesting, Peachy, David Peachy was taking the touch finding kicks, not Dykes or... How, Campbell, how so good was Peachy's kicking game as well? Peachy's... Yeah, it really reminded me. And I, I, that is, I, I'd forgotten that. And then as soon as I saw him doing those long punts, I was like, actually, I remember that. And I remember in the the 2 semi-final against the Roosters when he kicked on the first, bizarrely, like he wanted to start a kicking duel. But anyway, I, we, we love the peach. Yeah, but, but on the, yeah. on the take the two, I just think that is this is a good example of how when you get the penalties, you just keep the pressure up by just having the score continue to tick over. And yeah. I think that hurt the Warriors the other night by not taking the two. We talked about it on the debrief and You're another right. – I had another ongoing a feud with Franco about the take and the two. It just, I'm, yeah, it just takes the it takes the decision making away, and it's um. Oh, that worries one was that was that at six nil or twelve nil when they had the opportunity to take the two because both nil, ways have gone fourteen nil. Fourteen nil. That was I was surprised by that, and I even remember um, I think it was the the match I talked about it a little while ago where we beat the the Roosters back in I think it was two thousand five sixteen ten after being down ten nil. Uh, at halftime, and the Roosters had the same thing too, where I think we'd scored, it was 10-6. Mm. They had the opportunity to take the two and just put it back to a six-point ball game, and bizarrely, they just took a tap, uh, and then we end up winning. And it was just, you're right, you put that scoreboard pressure on. I think the only time it doesn't make sense if you're going from an eight to a 10-point lead, um, but even still in certain conditions, that's Eight to a like 10, yeah, like sometimes. Yeah. And also it depends how wide time. you are as well. So if you're a bit wide, yeah. then... And with it, the be not worth taking it's definitely worth taking also when you um if your halfback or five eight has been the person who's been injured so if yes. it's a high shot on your halfback you should always take it because yeah, you're right typically not yeah. your attacking set's not as good so yeah it's and you yeah if it's not going to be converting points you're less likely to get an attacking kick into if you right. if you want to kick kickers are out but we're preaching to the converted there Shortly after his 15th minute, which was great because it was a bit of sweet justice after the forward pass ruling against the Bulldogs, uh, an outside-inside play, uh, which put Peachy through, uh, and then Peachy with a very flat pass back on the inside to Jason Ferris to score next to the post. Uh, Bill Harrigan was in line again. The yeah, they no, get a bloody abused it and said you can't watch this. Blowing up, going at least a metre forward. And then the best part was there was an inline shot right at the end. It was about the fourth replay they showed yeah. the try. In line that showed that the pass was about half a metre backwards and Jason Ferris leaned backwards. And I remember Silo going, actually, well, based on that, I can pay that. And then Gus was like, no, nah, it was still forward. It's like, no, that 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 is as good as it gets. That's If you've got a... You need to have a camera on rails and see if it's gone backwards or not. It was backwards out of their hands. It was a try. Anyway, 14 nil, which was a bit serendipitous if you look uh -huh. at the Cowboys... Cowboys uh, 2016 prelim as well. Uh, that pass back on the inside to Chad was very flat, but the referee was right there. Uh, the Fox commentary, which are full of Queenslanders, were blowing up and it put us 14 nil up. So read Corey and weep. Parker. Yeah, exactly. Read Corey it Parker. and weep. So here we were. And then uh, shortly after, what I did love was uh, in the 20th minute, a little stab kick into the end goal. David Peachy beat three Bulldogs defenders with one step. It was so good. And it, Will Kennedy was showing a little shades of that the other night, but Peachy was just peak form there. Um, then we had a Steve Price charge down on Adam Dyke's kick, uh, and then Colin Best put Shane Martini over the sideline with a fantastic tackle. Which oh, was how good was that when he did that? Was that was so try good. Up. Steve yeah, Price doing his, his charge downs and break – well, he missed Dyke's uh, legs that time, but we, we remember what he did to Tony Kane many years later. Uh Willie Talau finally scored a try. Um, that was, a, that was to, the Darren Bitt um, kind of ball playing, wasn't he? He's such a good player, Yeah, Darren. Yeah, he was a ball, bank, ball playing prop. Uh, and even Darren Smith at 5'8 uh, uh, was pretty good there too. Um, yeah, he did make some errors in the game though, Darren Smith. He did. El Masri had a rare miss from the sideline. Uh, and then just as they were talking up a Bulldogs comeback, Nick Graham nailed a 40-20. It was his, the first, I believe, of his career. It was the fourth for uh, the season. He kicked an earlier one that season, hadn't he? 
Oh, oh, Mate, they, oh, they were talking Adam Dykes to kick three that year. Adam Dykes, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, but Nick Graham had absolutely nailed it, and he knew it too. He knew straight away, and he was he was playing to the because I think um, so all that all that had work at Woolwear Oval playing for Cronulla Seagulls in his youth, Nick Graham. There you go, because Bill Harrigan had a paid it hadn't paid it initially, and Graham was pointing at the touchy, going, "No, that's I was inside the forty, and that went outside the 20. So uh, that had us. There was an Adam Peak miss. Or we we from that scrum. Uh, Andrew Pierce lost the ball early in the set, and then Future Shark Adam Peak basically lost it one tackle later. Matt yeah, Rogers yeah. scooped it up and flew down the left and scored, which I found interesting because I was like, oh, I always remember Rogers being a right winger. Uh, but since he came back from injury on the left, Colin Best was carving up on the right. So Rogers slotted into Brent Gross slash Damian Moston's wing on the left uh, and scored there to make it 18-4. Uh, and then there was a bit of an injury scare right before halftime. And then uh, Preston Campbell... Actually, sorry, I'd completely missed it earlier on. Preston Campbell had scored a great try in the 18th minute uh, shortly after the uh, the Jason Ferris try. Uh, Campbell had uh, taken an inside pass from Dykes and scrambled over. Uh, That's and right, because he was just such a good, good support player, Campbell, in the middle. There was a moment like... just before halftime as well, Maddie, where um, where the Sharks have got a set on the Bulldogs' try line and the organisation was just missing with... With, without having a, you know, Brett Kamali organization style halfback, like it was, that's, it was a really bad that's, set. That yeah, you're right. There was a couple. Of, I think it was about only about two sets across that match. But you'll see, I suppose, later on in the the 2001 prelim against Newcastle, where having and Dean Treister has spoken about it too, where having that I don't know James Maloney or Brett Kamali or Andrew Johns to take the game by the scruff of the net really would have helped. Uh, but mm. yeah, Campbell did score a try to make it. That would have been twenty nil. Sorry, the dogs hit back to make it twenty to four, and then it was Johns that sorry Rogers that scored to make it twenty four four right on half time. There was a a knee concern or um, a bit of a knock that Preston Campbell took to his to his knee there, which which had I remember at the time going oh that doesn't look good. Uh, but anyway, went to half time at twenty four four up. Uh, and Ray Warren, quote unquote, as the teams were running off, said, oh, there are signs that maybe a 20-point margin won't be an impossibility for the Dogs. So you could tell that the, the Channel 9 commentary were really riding home the Dogs, no matter well, they're what. They're also trying yes. to sell in that you shouldn't switch off in the match. Oh, isn't it? True, true, true. But anyway, at halftime, it was Sharks with 63% of the ball, all the run-in, all the running, sorry. And uh, basically, shortly into the second half, it didn't let up. Uh, Preston Campbell crawling over with a, another burst of electric speed from a. It was lots of lots of in, outside inside, kind of like the same play that the Storm had with Billy Slater cutting back on the inside. But it was a, a real mm. mixture of that. A lot of the time, it was off the one off the ruck going wide to Dykes back inside to Campbell, or occasionally it was as Campbell uh, going wide to him with Peachy cutting back on the inside. But it was just carving up quick play. The balls were just on a hot day. Uh, against a tired dogs forward pack that were already missing, uh, and they had the head clash later. And yeah, that Steve Frieden. It was interesting. Andrew Pierce copped a, a head clash and was knocked out cold, and then continued playing. Uh, and it was only after Funny eight that minutes. how they were doing that, wasn't it? And yeah, it was. Well, it I mean, Lau had the one where he went back yeah, on. That yeah, was that, that was the wrong. thing there, and that was even as recently as only what we're talking 2013, 2014, yeah. when HIA came in. So that was the era then. But looking now, it's rather. Ghastly, but uh, Chris, you know what Chris else was... I noticed watching this back, um, and the yeah. full highlights on YouTube was the simplicity of the halftime stats and the way that Sterlo and Gould presented them. I just yeah. think it's so you know, and they had this kind of graph where they showed the completed sets and then um, the errors and then the different moments of the tries. I think it's such a simple way of of breaking the game down, and then also Sterlo's like they, I they were they were, I think they were better then. I think so too. I think Sterlo's breaking down of the old chalk of yeah. Yeah, this player isolated is way better than Andrew Johns with his fancy screen and the highlight this and put a, a, a ring around this player. Uh, also too, you write that, I think they called it the possession um, meter or whatever it was, where basically just showed each set at how how it ended, where they got to the yeah. sixth tackle or whether yeah. they conceded a try, where they error. And it was really good. Like looking at that, you could see there was a large period in the middle of, the ma- of that first half where the Sharks didn't drop the ball, completed it every set or the complete, either completed with it. or scored a try. And it just depicted where the game was won and lost, where now they go into, yeah, who's had any, how many uh, post-contact meters, which, yeah, cool. They're, they're interesting stats, but you're not actually looking at how the, the entire team's performing and, 
and yeah, who's dominating here or there. But Chris McKenna was out of the match in about the well, the eighth minute they highlighted. It was midway through the first half. He came off and didn't come back, unfortunately, which was was a real bummer for the following week. That was the end of his been, season. Yeah, end of his season. And he played 2002 and then he left the Sharks after that. But yeah, it was a, a rib, or they talk, refer to a rib or sternum injury, but so difficult to play through that. Uh, so Luke Stewart came off the bench and they were talking up the fact that he was a centre uh, in his juniors, and we saw that to great effect later in the uh, second saw half. That awesome, he, saw that awesome try. Yeah, turned the speed on and ran about 50 metres to score. But early in the second half, uh, Preston Campbell did uh, burst through that gap, as I said, and crawled over the line to make it, uh, what was that, 32-4. Um, Darren Britt gave an offload to Steve Price shortly after that to bring him back to 30 points to 10. Uh, and it's the 55th minute was the Andrew Pierce heavy tackle, uh, including his head g- hitting the ground first, and then him basically getting up and playing on. Uh, and then the he's 60th such minute, a, such a war horse, Andrew Pierce, wouldn't he? Oh, he was, he was, and that was his second last or final. So I have to confirm that it was very close to the end of his career. I remember uh, you're watching as well, Dennis Scott from the Bulldogs, kind of like a bit of a cheap shot on him while he's on the ground too. Yeah, you're right because he. He'd been hit by two players and then basically gone backwards and, and hit his head directly on the ground. It wasn't a – you could see them give it now as a lifting tackle. I don't think it was. I think it was just awkward. Yeah. But you're right, they did carry on with it. But the 60th minute, I think, was my favourite moment of the match, and it might be yours too. Uh, it's also in our intro, and you would have heard it, I'm sure, on Sharkcast as well. They play the uh, – uh, the commentary for this. Uh, Stevens away for Lang, Martin Lang, Martin Lang. I don't think I've seen him score a try before. Uh, so he good. Run out of the stadium or something. Sorry? That one? Doesn't, doesn't they say he'll run out of the stadium or something? Maybe, I think, yeah, afterwards too. But he, yeah, so yawning gap. It was, And it was so good that it was Stevens actually, like, so his prop partner for years put him through that hole. Uh, and you're right, he. Given he ran so hard and there was no one touched him, it was it was almost like that to yell at him to, to put the ball down, kind of like in... Yeah, you know, we knew the match was over when that try went over and then also when they put Corey Hughes to halfback and they took Trindle off. The Bulldogs, yes. they were just a mess and they didn't know what to do. So they took Trindle off and then put him back on and they had they had second rowers playing out in the centres. They were just an absolute mess by the end. Yeah, which is... Yeah, I mean, it, the, you take that many players out of it, you take your, your key playmakers in and Astor and, and the like out, that that will, that will cause that effect. But th- we bashed them too. Our forward pack, which weren't known bruisers, were just rolling up the middle. And it was probably a function of just taking uh, sharks, yeah, feeding frenzy, so to speak, feeding Fronze the feeding following Fronze. year. Feeding Fronze. Feeding from 2002 for, oh, how good was he? Side point. But the, yeah, so it was... Side. The Bulldogs were still a really good side, and I think the Sharks played played very well. Interesting stat on the seventy seventh minute, uh, there was eighteen errors to fifteen, so the Sharks had quite a few errors in the, in the second half, despite scoring a lot of tries. Mm. And that error rate if the, in this day and age, people would be saying, "Oh, you're going to get smashed," and you're right. But it was early two thousands league was different. There was less ruck interference that came the following year in two thousand two. There was lots of quick play the balls, lots of quick turnovers. It was really entertaining and. I mean, rounding up the try, so you had the Martin Lang try, Colin Best weeding run over 60 metres to score in the 65th minute. Uh, Campbell came off. Uh, Luke Stewart did his awesome run down the right to, to run 50 metres to score. Uh, and then they mentioned Jason Stevens had played 65 minutes straight, which on a hot, uh, sunny Sunday afternoon in, in September is a beast. That is awesome. Uh, they showed vision of Preston Campbell icing his knee in the 73rd minute. Lots of us were wor- worried there. Uh, we lost a scrum against the feed late on, which was yeah. also a bit interesting. That was interesting. And then in the 80th minute to bring up 50 points for only the second time in Cronulla Sharks history, uh, Dyke stepped back inside from the scrum. It wasn't quite the, the grand final scrum move, but it was still pretty good. Jason Ferris, who was hooker, had broke out of the scrum, backed up on the inside, did a huge dive to score and bring up 50. Uh, Dykes converting the try in, I suppose, his second final match uh, of his Cronulla Sharks edition one first career stint. before he left to Parramatta in his first stint before he came back. I uh, love 52 points. Adam Dykes as a player for the Sharks. He's so probably good. my favourite of that era. Rogers and Peach. Yeah. They're just so good, those guys, weren't they? Yeah, Rogers, Peach. Um, Paul, Paul McNicholas was great. Seeing him, he he would depart. To he South was the South Tom Aylerwood of that era, Paul McNichols. He was his starting second row, wide running. He was carving up, so he was about eight He's foot tall so as well. Real. 
tackle, wasn't he? Yeah, so uh, awkward to tackle. He, yeah, so that was definitely his best season, I think, in first grade. I haven't looked at his stats later, but he did uh, go two One souths um, and had he had a good Sorry, match as well. Uh, looking at it, so... Talking points? Well, yeah, we'll just, I was one final point. Oh, actually, we'll move on because one of those talking points is on there. So uh, looking at it, the Bulldogs' record, obviously, great win for us there. We didn't beat them in the regular season that year. We beat them in 2000 both times, but they weren't particularly good that year. It was a bit of a rebuilding one for them. Uh, and then the following year, 2002, they would have well, they were runaway minor premiers until they had their points stripped due to the salary cap issues. They kept the team together. 03, they made a prelim final. 04, they made and won the grand final. So he wouldn't beat them again until 2005. And you look at that side, and yes, they did have their salary cap issues, but it was still like you had the guys like so Willie Mason coming through. He was very young then and then really kicked on. You had well, Brent Sherwin Sherw and, and a Nasta in the halves. You had El Masri came of age, and El Masri was very underrated too. For, he got known for his goal kicking. He didn't start goal kicking until five years into his career because of a guy called Darryl Halligan. Halligan. Exactly. So, and he became the highest point scorer of all time. Imagine if he was kicking full time prior to that. So, and he was a very, very solid winger. So, um, I think more so than Halligan was. I think he was a really good footballer. And then you've got just that hard forward pack of the old guys that were moving on. You had Marco Mealy and the like. So, um, the Bulldogs had a lot of success following that, and we didn't have any success against them really. I remember what in two thousand two, we were during our losing streak, we were pushing them at the showground. We we're about to hit the yeah. front, and then we got a Ryan McGoldrick try pullback for a forward pass, so that didn't ha- didn't help. Uh, moving on, the injuries we were worried about a few, and we we should get your your physio mate uh, on another time to review this era because he was right in the thick of the the working. Oh yeah, the, the, the story Francis has got about. Um, Adam Dykes and his knee and him going into the cold pool as I yeah, remember well, that injury myself that time. Mm, and that was um, hearing that about was that. All, yeah, that was all the focus of the media in 2001 in the week before against the Broncos and then the following week against the Knights. And I think even on the day before, the day before on game day, they were saying that Dykes is very likely to be ruled out. He did end up playing. I don't remember that uh, any murmurs around the, the Bulldogs match, interestingly, and he played the entire match as we saw converting the, the so try. It just yet. seemed kind of dumb to have him keep going but yeah well Preston Campbell came off so maybe the plan was to pull him off but Campbell had a pressing knee injury we had Rogers that oh, had, had a said Paul McNicholas at 58 yeah or even even play with 12 men if you need to but I suppose it was similar to that conundrum in the the prelim we played in 2016 against the Cowboys where and I remember Michael Ennis copped a, a hit very late and we were worried and the E got up and it was fine I think it was the last tackle of the game but yeah. it was like gosh just stop tackling don't no just injuries stop tackling, no injuries get these guys off the field Exactly. Yeah, just, we just, just know with these finals, you just need to be absolutely um, injury free. Like just even do. one player out. And if you look at, you know, I'd say this about the 2016 Grand Final. If Melbourne Storm have Billy Slater in the team instead of Blake Green, then that one of those oh. passes at the end because Blake Green is not quite as fast at passing the ball right. as Billy Slater. Then I reckon the Storm score when they're oh, exactly. when the um, oh. like it's. Yeah. And you, and you saw yeah, what happened to the Bulldogs. They were like a top – they were an absolutely electric team in that season. And they yeah, just ran out of juice at the end. Yeah, they did. They had injuries at the, at the worst time. And that's – I mean, John Lang says that our best uh, team on paper during his era was 98. It was just crueled by injuries. But, yeah, you're right. 2016, if they had Slater, gosh, they may well have even jagged another trial to mid-match with just his speed and, and uh, elusiveness. So – uh, yeah, so we had Chris McKenna, McKenna obviously get injured and not play again in 2001 and basically didn't play that entire semi-final against the Bulldogs. Uh, and there was a few other worries too. So, yeah, it's um, including Andrew Pearce getting knocked out. So we were not quite as badly walking wounded as the Bulldogs, but we had our own concerns uh, and we had Brent Gross uh, replace Chris McKenna uh, the following week, which no disrespect to Brent Gross, but he's not he's even not, the same. He's not Statue of Liberty play, Chris McKenna. State Correct. of origin Australian player, yeah. is he? McKenna, um, the, beast. Yeah. The commentary, um, yeah, interesting. Oh, uh, God, that was just so Bill Gould at his just yeah. hating the Sharks era. He just always yeah. hated the Sharks, Bill Gould. He hadn't pulled out the Bermuda Triangle yet, but there was lots of, I could tell, kind of, Sturlow was being quite glowing in his praise. I think Sturlow's always, uh, oh, he's been very objective. I don't think Sturlow could ever, apart from his, he will admit he's Parramatta. This was early Phil Gould commentary, though. 
It was. It was. But he, uh, Phil, he's, yeah, he's, he's only just got a more while now. opinionated. Uh, but, yeah, so put 52 points on and there was – there was a lot of oh, bulldogs didn't do this or bulldogs didn't do that or sharks were oh, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so nothing's changed there uh we could give him the uh the, the air time but we'll we'll move on from there nick graham absolute beast so good that opening try but also too just his offloads he's backing up his defense he could hit his kicking game uh, borderline forgot about it, and then I actually looked at the so early two thousand two, which was his, his, I suppose technically his final full season for the club, uh, when we played the Dragons at the Sydney Football Stadium to open the season. He had another blinder as well from Locke there, putting a kick in for a try, backing up Peachy to score another try. He was incredibly underrated in my opinion, uh, and wouldn't look out of place today if you had him there uh, instead of Cam McInnes. Or like Cam McInnes is great, but. Um, Nick Graham is oh, a yeah, key. Nick Graham. Yeah, yeah he's, he's almost... an unheralded shark, Nick Graham. I think he yeah. was local boy, he... just yeah. legend. People talk about I'd Victor Radley. Nick Graham on the ET Stand podcast at some stage, we actually, sh- wouldn't we? Well, we should get Nick Graham on. He Nick Graham would be did good. work. For, this is a long time ago. But, yeah, he did do mortgage breaking for my dad a long, long time ago. But, anyway, so we'll see. We'll make it cool. But, uh, yeah, so Nick Graham, I think people talk about Cam Murray and the like, and it's like, nah, they do not have the 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 ball handling skills, the that additional uh, playmaking focal point. And Brad Fittler came through, and I've heard him interviewed and say that he was his best position. He believed was lock. Uh, I'm not saying that Nick Graham was Brad Fittler, but he was he was very very handy. So it was great to see him have a have a very very solid game. And actually, I'd say probably a, almost a career best game and a career best era for him actually. Uh, and then looking at that, 50 points. So we'd scored 50 points on one other occasion in our history to that point. Who was it against? Was it the Knights? No. So it was, one, the Knights, we, was the Knights. Was the Knights one where we beat them 64 or whatever it was? Do you remember what year that was? That was 2002 then, was it? Yes, yeah, so that was after 2001. That was after so that. We, so yeah, that's right. We so had the 49-30 and the next year we pumped them yeah. 64-14 or whatever it was, wasn't it? Correct, 64 14, which uh, is a. We'll, All right, so we'll the biggest that score before sport. that was against like Western Suburbs or something like that, wasn't it? Close. It was against a team just down the road from you uh, in 1999, if that gives a hint. The Bears. The Bears. Or the 56, Beagles. 56 18 uh, at North Sydney Oval in two, sorry, 1999. Uh, that was the first time. So was that in our 33rd season? Uh, the Sharks finally breached the. Was that the, the Bears or the Northern Eagles? The Bears, the Bears in yeah, 1999. The Bears last, the last year. It was, of the Bears. it was actually, I think, the Bears' second last home game ever at North Sydney Oval. But uh, on a Saturday afternoon, Sharks won by an awful lot. Yeah, 56-18 in late 1999 was that one. Uh, so we've only that, scored. Let's do that game. Yeah, we'll, we'll cover that maybe when we cover the Dolphins because we'll, there's no yeah, history we'll against the Dolphins. We'll, we'll, we'll do that game we'll, when we cover Papua New Guinea or whichever team <laughs> comes in as the Bears. Whoever comes back at the Bears, so you look at all whoever that that Bears this, contact. Whoever, Comes back. Uh, that I love that Bears nineteen ninety nine or yeah. 90s team. That was so good. Well, we beat them the the home game against the Bears that year. We only beat them by one point. Uh, Mitch Healy field goal after Jason Taylor had missed one after we had a few players out. For there was Oregon, a um, so. there was a famous match with Paul Mellor against the North Sydney Bears where the Sharks had all of their State of Origin guys out, and Paul Mellor yeah. was just in the team and like, oh yeah, Paul Mellor, pretty good player. And then Mellor just beasted the North Sydney Bears and like was setting up tries. It was like Talakai esque. <laughs> <laughs> um, from Paul Mello. And that was when, he, when he was like the cult figure hero. Mello. Mello. I will give a shout out to, uh, you can hear the Sharkies chant at this uh, 01 semi plenty of times, which is which is you good. Uh, but yeah. anyway, in our history, we've only scored more than 50 points eight times. So what are we into our 50 Oh gosh, we're almost. We know there was, the, there was the Newcastle Knights one with the Maloney in 2016. There was the Manly yeah. one where it was what is a 68 nil or 68 six or whatever it was. 68 six, yeah. Whether the, uh, the penalty but didn't take the two to make it 70. I can't so remember what the other ones Stevens. were. Uh, yeah, there's a few in there. Uh, so we beat the, the Dragons this year, 52 16 or whatever it was. We beat South. 56 30 odd uh 54 30 back in 2003 i think it was uh we put 
Yeah, there's only five of them. We'll have the list. We'll, we'll make that a, a trivia topic another day, I think. But uh, yeah, it's interesting that we've only only breached that 50-point margin eight times, and this was only the second time we did it in a second time. Sharks aren't a team that just flog teams, are they? That just we put, put 40 on plenty of occasions, but on, on this occasion, not so much. Uh, I think I do have the stats here for that. Hound. Where are we? Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, so we put fifty six. Yeah, on the uh, uh, on so we got North Sydney. So we got the sixty eight six over Manly, sixty four fourteen over Newcastle, sixty two nil over Newcastle, fifty six eighteen over North Sydney, thirty four uh, to fifty four of the Sharks. We've spoken about fifty two ten here uh, and fifty two sixteen over St George Laura. Oh, and one match that is forgotten uh, very late in twenty twenty one. It was the Cronulla Sharks fifty, the West Tigers twenty at. Uh, that stadium at uh, Redcliffe up in Brisbane during the COVID affected oh, yeah. year. So that's what it. happened after uh, this match, Williams. What happens at the Sharks? Uh, do we well, to, yeah, we do we want to talk about we'll, that? Or we'll, just, we'll leave that for I'll another say, time. I'll say we were looking good until Paul Simpkins blew a penalty against us in possession, and then you know what happened. Absolute there. rubbish. And then you know what happened in the grand final when Parramatta basically capitulated. So uh, yeah, it was there for the taking, but. As we said, I think the missing link in this puzzle, the missing piece of it was a, a controlling or a game-managing halfback. Both Campbell and Dykes were fantastic and could put points on, but it's just that... that just in the that top games, of, you needed you needed both. To ice, yeah. So, yeah like you can um, just, like Andrew Johns is just a bit better than Jason Taylor. Yeah. In the grand yeah. final and also a bit, bit better against us. But we were... Desperately unlucky that next week. We will review that one, but let's not get into that, Williams. Nah. As we say. Let's enjoy this one. Let's sing the song now. Yeah. Anyway, everyone, hit the like and subscribe button. Tell us where you were for that match. Tell us how how terrible the commentary was, how great that era was. Tell us, yeah, what your thoughts on Paul McNicholas, Nick Graham, Luke Stewart, Andrew Pierce, Martin Lang, Jason Stevens, and the like. And the great, oh, they're just such a good team. Those David Peachy, Matt Rogers, Colin Best, Colin Best with try saving tackles. Oh, Colin oh, Best, so good. best from England. He was so yeah. good, Colin Best, wasn't he? Yeah. He was... So that was that was a fun one. That was a longer one than expected. Next week we'll be covering the 2008. I oh, just so uh, many points scored by the Sharks in that one. So yeah, uh, actually I think I was watching the replay, going, where are all these points going to come from? They've got to score at least another 20 points to hit that hit the margin. What's going on? Well, yeah, I remember watching week. it at the end. I was watching it back, and you can, and the link to um, watching it on YouTube will also be in the descriptor. Um, so if yeah. you want to go watch it on YouTube, it's a fun watch. It's a nice one to watch while you're doing some work. Have it over there on the side, of your little computer, just watching it in the YouTube. background. Just listening. Of course, the ETC is now available on on Spotify as well as YouTube. Um, and so please get involved in our groups and follow us on all of those channels. It does help us with the algorithm. And, Spread the word around other Sharks fans. We want to hear from you guys, don't we, Williams? We want to hear from... We do. We, we do. want to we hear from hear as your, many people as we can. Hear your thoughts. We'll give you a heads up now. We'll be covering the Round 25 2008 match at Leichhardt Oval against the West Tigers. Uh, they ain't going to finals, baby. First match in the post-Greg Bird era. Uh, and that'll be ahead of our match against the uh, Tigers at the same venue in Round 3 2024. Anyway, see you later, Legends. Hit the like and subscribe, and we'll chat to you soon. Go Sharks. Up, up, Cronulla. For over 50 years, people have come to see the Sharks play. Talent, skill, speed, intelligence, elite level athleticism. That's not these guys. Biased, one-eyed, opinionated, more often wrong than right. They make up for their complete lack of talent with pure dribble, gibberish and enthusiasm this is the et stand podcast